Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I come to talk to you about one of the most anticipated Met in 2 events, Catch the King. Similarly to the other event videos, I will explain how this event works, what loot can you get from it, and I will also teach you the most efficient way that I know to play the minigame. Like all my other videos, this one is mostly based on Met in 2's wiki page for this event. Everything I present you here is already there so that you can check it out. I'll leave the link to the page in the description of this video. So, without further ado, Let's hop into the video. In order for you to participate in the Catch the King event, you must be at least level 30. This event will be running from April 11th up until the end of the month, and the main goal of this event is to drop King cards. Using those cards, you will be playing a minigame that will award you with different chests according to the amount of points that you collected in the minigame. Be aware that usually the cards stop being dropped one day before the end of the event, on April 29th. Let's start with the main component of the event, the king cards. You can drop these cards in any monster as long as they are within your level range. Since last year, the cards don't drop onto the floor for you to pick them up anymore. As you can see here, they now go directly into the event interface. When you pick up your 25th card, the card's counter will reset back to zero, and the deck counter will be increased by one, since you need 25 cards to complete the deck for the minigame. You can carry up to a maximum of 999 decks. You can enter the minigame by pressing the start button. Note that, in this case, if I press start, I will be using only one deck, but you can choose to use between 1 and 5 decks at the same time. And no, that doesn't mean that you will be playing with more cards, or that you will have to play 5 games in a row before getting the rewards. The structure of the minigame will remain the same, regardless of the number of decks that you use. The only difference is that in the end, the number of chests you receive is the same as the number of decks that you used. To give you an example, if you played the minigame, got enough points to receive a silver chest and only used one deck, then you will receive one silver chest. But if instead you used, let's say, three decks, then you would receive three silver chests from that minigame alone. This really speeds up the process of using your decks, contrary to the other events like OK Cards, where it can be a bit boring to play the minigame using one deck at a time, especially if you have hundreds of decks, which is not unusual for most players in this type of events. Not only that, but the Catch the King minigame is way more fun to play compared to the OK Cards event, at least in my opinion of course. Upon starting the minigame, a 5x5 board with all the 25 cards you collected to form a deck will be displayed. All the cards on the board start face down, and you have to use the cards in your hand, which are displayed in the bottom of the board, to capture those board cards in order to accumulate the maximum amount of points. You have 11 cards at your disposal, and they are always the same in every game. 4 number 1 cards, 2 number 2, 2 number 3, 1 number 4, 1 number 5, and lastly, 1 king card, which is the most important card in this game. The 25 cards on the board are also always the same only their position changes. The board has 7 number 1 cards, 4 number 2, 5 number 3, 5 number 4, 3 number 5, and finally, 1 king card. At the very bottom of the interface, on the left side, you can check the highest score that your character reached in a single game. In the middle, you have a check button that enables pop-up messages whenever you make a move. I would maybe recommend you to keep this feature on in the first games while you're still learning but later on, you can just turn it off since it will just slow you down. Finally, on the right corner, you have a button to finish the game. Use this if you see that there's no more hope for the game that you're currently playing and don't want to waste more time in it. It will automatically give you a chest that corresponds to the points that you obtained if you have at least 10 points. I recorded some gameplay videos of the minigame to show you the method that I use to maximize the points, but before jumping into that section, I need to introduce you to the rules. Don't worry if they sound too complicated at first. I will try to keep it simple and concise, because I think you will understand it better by watching the gameplays in the later sections. You can always return to this section to review the rules if you want to. Anyways, I tried to summarize this section into four main topics. Number 1. Playing order. You are forced to play all your cards in ascendant order. This means that you can only play your number 2 card when you have no more number 1 cards available in your hand. Then, you need to play all your number 2 cards so that you can start using the number 3 cards. This logic will be applied until you reach the king card, which is the last card that you can use right after the number 5 card. Number 2. Cards Capture Due to this specific playing order, you won't be able to choose which card to play. Instead, 
The available cards for the current move will be displayed in the top right corner with the remaining cards in your hand shown at the bottom. During each move, you must choose which face down card you want to try and capture. When you click on the face down card, this one will be flipped and get revealed to you. If the number of the card on the board is higher than the number of the card that you used, then you will get no points, your card will be removed from your hand and the card on the board will be turned face down again. However, if the number of the card that you used is higher than the number of the card that is on the board, then not only will you get awarded some points, but you also get to keep the card that you used for your next move and the card on the board will be kept face up, meaning that it has been captured. If you somehow try to capture a card that has the same value as the card that you are using, then the outcome will be the same as in the previous case, except that now you cannot keep your card, it will be removed from your hand. The king card is special, and it has an exception to this rule, since it can capture any card to get awarded the points, but it can only be used once. If possible, you should try to use this card to capture the other king card that is face down on the board, because only a king card can capture another king card. Number 3. Points. This is not exactly a rule, more like an information, but I think it is important to be here since it's complementary information for rule number 2. These are the points that you get upon capturing each one of the cards. Number 1 cards, 10 points. Number 2, 20 points. Number 3, 30 points. Number 4, 40 points. Number 5, 50 points. And king card, 100 points. You can also get an extra 10 points for every diagonal, column or row that you completely capture. The amount of points that you obtained in the current minigame is displayed at the right side of the interface. Number 4. Tracking 5s. This is the rule upon which we'll base our future strategy. The number 5 cards have a special property that allows you to track their location whenever you try to capture nearby cards. Whenever you try to capture a card, regardless of which card it is, it will always display an animation of a blinking blue skull if there is at least one number 5 card in the adjacent spots of the card that you try to capture. Note that the spots that I'm talking about do not include the selected card's position. This means that if you try to capture a card in a certain position of the board, and that card happens to be a number 5 card, it will only display the animation if there is at least one other number 5 card in the adjacent spots. Otherwise, it won't display any animation, meaning that there is no other number 5 card nearby that one that you just tried to capture. Now, why is it so important to pinpoint the position of the number 5 cards? Well, it's due to their second property, which is not so helpful for us. You are not allowed to use the number 5 card that you have in your hand to capture any card that is adjacent to at least one other number 5 card on the board. If you try to do it, you will get no points and you will also lose the number 5 card from your hand. Moving on to the strategy. Since you can use all the other previous cards like numbers 1, 2, 3 and 4 to capture the cards in the adjacent spot that your number 5 card can't reach, your goal should be to track the position of all the three face down number 5 cards and capture its adjacent cards as early as possible to maximize your points. By doing this, you can use your lower value cards to pinpoint the position of the number 5 cards and save the higher value cards to capture the remaining ones. If we can also find the king card during the initial process, then that would be amazing, so that we don't have to gamble its position when we're playing with our king card since it can only be used once, if you remember correctly. Speaking of the king card, don't worry if its position on the board has a number 5 card adjacent to it. You can still use your king card to capture it and get the 100 points. I know this seems a bit overwhelming right now, so I prepared two gameplay examples so that you can understand it better. You'll notice that I'm using two external tools in this gameplays. The first is a catch the king simulator to, well, simulate the minigame. I have to use this because at the time I'm recording this video, the event is not active yet. The second tool is a helper that makes it easier for the player to keep track of all the cards on the board. Just a quick disclaimer, I do not own any of these tools, they were created by a member of the Portuguese community. I will link his github in the description of this video, as well as the links for the simulator and the helper in case you want to use them. If you prefer not to utilize these tools, you can achieve similar results by using Excel or even Paint to keep track of the cards. Just choose the method that better fits your preferences. Personally, I find this approach convenient and efficient. Before jumping into the gameplay, let me teach you how to use these two tools that I mentioned. 
If you're not going to use them, feel free to skip this section. The simulator works in the same way as the minigame would in your Metin 2 client. It picks your next card automatically and you only have to choose which card of the board you want to try and capture. You can check your points in the right side of the tool. This simulator randomizes the position of the cards every time you refresh the page. This way you can simulate the game over and over again. The helper is pretty simple to understand. After you try to capture a card, you will drag your mouse to the correspondent spot and you will press the number on the keyboard that matches the revealed card's number. For the king card, you can either press the number 6 or the letter K on your keyboard. If the card that you revealed triggered that blue skull animation that we were talking about, then you will have to press the shift key as well as the number on the keyboard that matches the revealed card's number. This will mark the adjacent spots as dangerous and paint them red. It will also provide you with a percentage that illustrates the chance of a number 5 card being there. At the end of every move, you need to pass the revealed card's information into the helper slots. Either you capture the card or not, so that the helper can properly count the cards that you used. By properly counting the cards, the helper will mark with the red cross the slots in which you should not use your number 5 card when it's time for you to play it. At the bottom of the helper, you will see the number of unrevealed cards on the board. If you try to keep track of more cards than you should, you will get this warning. One important thing that I think you should know is that I don't really take the percentages of the helper into consideration when using my strategy, and I think you shouldn't do it either. Even though the helper works amazingly, and it is great to keep track of the cards, sometimes the marked red spots are misleading. I'll show you examples of this later on in the video, but please don't be lazy, use the helper to keep track of the cards, but don't do it in autopilot mode. Do it slow and think about your next move so that you can avoid useless moves and preserve your important cards, therefore increasing the chances for you to get the highest amount of points. Now that you know how to use the tools, let's take a look at the gameplay so that I can teach you the strategy. This will be my strategy, but you can come up with one of your own, maybe even better than this one. We start with an easy game where everything kinda went smoothly. From now on, I'll refer to the spots on the board by their coordinates in the helper. I start the game by revealing the cards on these four corners of the board. 1-1, one, 1-3, one, one, three, 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 and 3-1. Three, by doing this, I can have information of the whole board and, as you can see, we have a good start. We already found the king card. That's 100 guaranteed points already. We can see that the top right corner of the board has no number 5 cards, so we can ignore it. Now, in this situation, you have plenty of options. Personally, I choose to reveal the 2-4 slot in order to gather more information on 3 other slots. And, to my surprise, I found one of the 5s and now I know that there is another one in its surroundings. On the next move, I reveal the 0-0 slot to show you that you can also check the corners in these situations. I only gathered information on 2 other slots instead of 3, but this could be a good tactic on some other scenario. Luckily for me, I found information about the whereabouts of the other number 5 card. Now, notice that this is one of the cases of misleading information that I talked about earlier. If you remember correctly, when we revealed the 5 in the 2-4 slot, the blue skull animation got triggered, meaning that one of the two missing 5s is on slot 1-4, 2-3 or 3-4. On our last move, we checked that the number 2 card on slot 0-0 also triggered the blue skull animation meaning that the third and last number 5 card must be either on slot 1-0 or 0-1. We know this extra information because we played it slow and analyzed the game, but the helper is still showing us potential red spots on other slots like 0-2, 1-2, 0-3, 0-4, 4-3 and 4-4. I can't stress this enough, do not blindly trust the helper. You have to use your head and play it slow so that you don't fall for misleading information like this. Moving on. On my next move, I want to check where the top left number 5 card is. Since I know that it must be one of these two slots, I will reveal the 2-0 slot to notice that the animation didn't trigger. This can only mean that the 5 is on the 0-1 slot. By the way, I could have also revealed the 2-1 slot to obtain this information. Notice that still after revealing the second number 5 card, we still have misleading information. Again, play it slow and use your head. We know that the card we're looking for must be in one of these three slots, therefore I choose to reveal the 4-4 slot. Doing that triggered the animation, 
meaning that we found our last number 5 card on slot 3-4. Note that if the animation hadn't been triggered and the slot 3-4 was clear, we could have, for example, checked the 0-4 slot. If that slot triggers the animation, then the number 5 card would be in slot 1-4. Otherwise, that 100% means that the number 5 card would be in the 2-3 slot. But the helper wouldn't autofill that information because it would still have other potential red areas to cover. But what matters is that you would know it was there and you could play around it. Ok, now back to the actual game. We know the position of all the number 5 cards and king card, so now our goal is to reveal the maximum amount of cards that are adjacent to the number 5 cards because eventually we'll have to play our number 5 card and we cannot play it in those adjacent spots, otherwise we'll lose the card and receive no points. We need to clear those spots using the lower cards. Luckily, the 5s on this game are located at the borders of the board, leading to less adjacent cards. The worst case scenario happens when they're all in the middle of the board. Make sure to keep putting all new information in the helper so that it can keep counting the cards. Now that we're using our number 4 card, make sure to capture all the 2s and 3s that we left behind when we were using lower cards. After that, you can go back into clearing the adjacent slots of the number 5 cards. Unfortunately, we found another 4 while clearing the adjacent spots before we could finish the task. This means that we are now using our number 5 card and we need to be extra careful in this move. Note that the helper is providing us extra information. It marked the slots where we cannot play our card with the red cross. Since we already know where the king card is, there is no risk of losing this number 5 card. We can now clear the remaining slots. So, we captured all the remaining cards except for slot 1-0. Sadly, we won't be able to capture it, otherwise we will lose our card and get no points. This leaves us with only one more option, to capture one of the number 5 cards on the board. Our only option is the 0-1 slot, since the other two 5s are adjacent to each other, and we would get no points. If, in other scenario, you happen to have three separate 5s, always choose the one that will allow you to form a line, column or diagonal. Remember that these give you 10 extra points and it could really make the difference in some games. To finish the game, all we have to do is to capture the king card on the board using our own king card and that's an easy 100 points plus 10 for the row it created. We finished the game with 670 points, which is a very good amount. So yeah, this was a good game, but unfortunately, not all games are like this. As my second and last example, I'll show you a game that did not go so well even though I tried to apply the same strategy. We start with the same strategy of revealing these four corners. Now this is kind of a weird game. It's good that we have the exact location of 2 out of the 3 number 5 cards on the board, but they are in the middle of the board, which are the worst possible spots. Well, there is still hope, so we'll continue with the strategy. We reveal the 4-2 slot and it triggers the animation, meaning that the last 5 is in the slot 4-1. This is great. Now, all we have to do is clear the adjacent slots and find the king card. We already cleared the top right 5 as good as we could at the moment. Now. Moving on to the hardest part of the board. Well, this was doomed to happen. Still, we managed to clear a good amount of adjacent spots. Let's now use our number 5 card on the only 4 available slots left and hope that we can gather some more points. Ok, so we were able to retrieve some extra points from the bottom right corner and now our only available play is to capture one of the 5s on the board. All 5s are available for capture because they are not adjacent to each other and since none of them will allow us to complete a row, column or diagonal then it doesn't matter which one to choose, so I choose the slot for one. Now we run our last move. We have to capture the king card using our own king card, but we have no idea where it could be. There are 6 unknown slots on the board, so in this situation you have to just take a wild guess and hope for the best. I chose to reveal the slot 01 and, to my amazement, I found it. This is a massive move because we were able to reach 420 points. These two examples were not enough to cover all scenarios that you will encounter when playing the minigame. So make sure to use this simulator and helper to practice as much as you can so that you can craft a solid strategy for this event. 
To give you some context regarding the points, if you manage to get 550 or more points at the end of the game, then you will receive a golden chest. If you get between 400 and 549 points, you will receive the silver one. Lastly, if you get between 10 and 399 points, you will receive a bronze chest. This means that the first gameplay example that I just showed you would result in a golden chest, while the second one would result in a silver chest. The chests have a wide variety of rewards, so I'll just list the most important ones. The bronze chests will mostly give you small amounts of yang or experience points. If you're lucky enough, you might be able to receive one king deck so that you can play another game and try to get a better chest. The silver chests can award you with one B-type item enchantment, one item enchantment plus, and one magic stone. The golden chests can give you the same rewards I mentioned for the silver chests, plus a few more good rewards, like one mystical core draconish, where you can get a legendary alchemy stone, a one day hero medal, one moonstone, one pet book chest, a 20 day battle lion mount, one blacksmith stone, and one titanium dioxide. If you're curious about the complete list of rewards, you can take a look at it in the wiki or in the event NPC located in the village during the event. Speaking of this NPC, you can also check the event's leaderboard there. If you manage to stay in the top 10 players that acquire the most amount of points throughout all the minigames played during the event, you will receive extra golden chests. The top 1 player receives 10 chests, while the top 2 player receives 5, and the top 3 receives 3. The remaining players, from 4th to 10th spot, receive one chest. This is a good event to take advantage of the auto-hunt to drop the cards 24-7. There are plenty of good maps for you to farm cards, just make sure you have the highest amount of item drop as you can. Also, if you have the money for it, use bravery capes in the maps where the monsters don't attack you automatically. By doing that, you will maximize the number of cards that you drop. For the lower level players, I can recommend the Devil's Catacombs, Spider Dungeon 3, and Red Forest. For the, let's say, mid-level players, I can recommend Gautama's Fall and Enchanted Forest. For the Yohara players, the best place you can farm cards is in the Mysterious Dungeon. If your character is not strong enough to be out on hunting in that map, then you can always leave it in Yohara's first map, the Abandoned Fortress. During the event, you can also find King cards for sale in the item shop. These are the three packages available. Pink package, it contains 7 cards and costs 6 dragon coins. Blue package, contains 27 cards for 19 dragon coins. And lastly, the red package, which contains 145 cards for 89 dragon coins. So, I think this sums it up. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions regarding this event so that I can enlighten you. If you are using a different strategy, feel free to share it in the comments. You can also leave suggestions of other topics that you would like me to cover in future videos. If you want to see more content like this, feel free to drop a like and subscribe to this channel. Also, if you want to directly interact with me, you can find me streaming at twitch.tv slash goldenmedal1. Feel free to also check any of my other videos on this channel. And if you're interested in coming back to my team too, please consider creating your Gameforge account using my invitation link in the description below, so that you can contribute to the growth of this channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you guys on the next video. Peace.